Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Hopefully you're all suitably uh, fed, watered and caffeinated. So keep us going through this afternoon. Um, after that wonderful morning of combination of inspirational, interesting um, and challenging talks, um, we now move into the afternoon sessions where we'll continue that, hopefully. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Gemma Attrell. Um, she's the uh, chief uh, scientist, lead scientist and chief space weather um, person at DST, DSTL. Um, previously educated in University of South, in South Wales, Aberystwyth, um, and then a PhD at Mullard, um, MSSL, and has been working at DSTL for um, some years now. And she's going to talk to us about the Circe experiment. Thank you so much. Right, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so yes, Gemma Atchell, and I work at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, um, based at DSTL Porton Dam. So it's my absolute pleasure to be here today, um, and I think the standard of talks in the morning session were absolutely phenomenal. So here goes. Okay, um, I wanted to give a little bit of an introduction here and just set the context for this piece of work. Um, so the space environment really matters. You wouldn't consider approaching anything to do with a submarine without actually thinking about the ocean. Um, and it's important also to consider the impact of weather on how that system will operate. Just like that, the space environment is incredibly important, not just for satellite operations, but actually it has a significant impact on a whole range of different systems, some of them actually ground-based. And like meteorological weather, space weather is also highly dynamic. So what is space weather? A little bit of science coming in here. Um, it's essentially a generic umbrella term um, that's used to describe the variations in terms of the flux of energy and matter entering our near-Earth system, um, originating mm -hmm. primarily from the sun. Um, so we talk about coronal mass ejections, CMEs. These are huge eruptions of magnetized plasma, um, so magnetic field, um, that explode from the solar atmosphere. Um, and these will typically take between one to four days to reach our near-Earth environment. Um, I've put here the little boy eruption at Hiroshima, 10 to the 13 joules, just to give you some indication of the magnitude of the power that we are talking about here and the energy that we're talking about, 10 to the 25 for a typical CME. Um, solar flares are similarly very energetic as well, um, similar category, but this is a release of pure energy. So the impact time from release of the sun to the earth is at the speed of light, so we have only eight minutes. Um, the solar wind is also a continuous outflow of energetic charged particles that comes from the sun and also interacts with our near-Earth environment. So space weather and all of these different dynamics drive disruption to our near-Earth atmosphere, and specifically a part of that called the ionosphere. Um, so this is part of our upper atmosphere that enables our beyond line of sight systems to function. Um, so this is basically responsible for the ability of radio waves to bounce off of the ionosphere, or indeed, if you're dealing with satellites, they have to make their way through that um, part of the atmosphere as well. So you can see it's really important for a whole range of different systems. Um, it is, the ionosphere is naturally subject to a day nighttime variability as the planet spins facing the sun and then returning to the night side, but it's also disturbed by space weather as well. So why do we care? Um, severe space weather has actually been on the UK National Risk Assessment formally since 2011. It's a relatively new risk in terms of the things that we talk about, um, but this is in recognition of the impact on our modern way of life, our critical national infrastructure and our modern sensitive systems that we use. From a defence point of view, we're interested primarily for two reasons. One is to enable confident attribution of the source of disruption. We need to know very quickly if something, the kit is just not working, if there's a natural disruption or whether it's a targeted malicious intervention. So being able to distinguish between those things rapidly is really important for us. And we also need to be able to protect our equipment and personnel from the effects of space weather. Um, and this is in order to sustain a resilient capability. <coughs> so moving on to focus on CERSI then. So this is a collaborative effort between the UK Defence Science and Technology Laboratory and our US partners at the Naval Research Laboratory. And we focused on developing our capability um, in small satellites for ionospheric physics. Um, there's plenty of information available in the open literature in this, and um, just a couple of examples there. 
Um, but it's been a real collaborative effort and I'm going to go through some of the UK partnerships in, that, in the rest of this talk. So we're really focused on the ionosphere, coordinated ionospheric reconstruction experiment. So as I've mentioned, this is important for a range of systems, um, both civil and defence. And we're really here trying to make in situ measurements. And um, there was a question earlier on the outreach side about, you know, why is it important that we go to space? Well, you can't do in situ measurements from space from the ground. Also, ionospheric physics and the plasma that we talk about is actually really difficult to mimic on the ground. So there's an opportunity here to do some in situ measurements, also combined with some remote sensing techniques. Um, and we're also looking at creating a tomographic representation of the ionosphere. Um, and particularly, we're looking at the electron density here. And um, the electron density is really important when you're talking about radio propagation. So we have two 6U CubeSat buses. I guess most people in this room and on the call are familiar with the CubeSat unit, 10 by 10 by 10 centimetres. Um, so if you think of your sort of family size box of crunchy nut, that's kind of where we're going with the size of the bus. And obviously with the solar arrays extended, as you can see in the image on the bottom right here, um, much larger structure. So the two satellites will be flying um, lead trail. They'll be flying in tandem um, and they'll be in a near polar orbit. Um, we're aiming for 555 kilometers um, with a sun synchronous um, and 98 degrees inclination. So we are scheduled for the first UK launch. And this is the launch that's been mentioned a couple of times from Spaceport Cornwall later this year. Um, and in Cersei's case, because we're working with our US partners at the Naval Research Lab, um, this particular launch opportunity for us is being facilitated by the US DOD Space Test Program. In terms of operations, um, we don't have any propulsion on board these buses. Um, we're very much focused here on looking at the impact of differential drags. This is changing the profile of the satellites and um, utilizing those large solar arrays. And we're looking for a baseline in track separation of between 250 and 500 kilometers. And the trail satellite will actually be flipping around every orbit. Um, and this is to allow the different sets of instruments um, to collect the maximum data that they can. Um, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but you can see the locations, um, what's called the tri-tip instruments here. This is that tomographic electron density sets of instrumentation. Um, that functions only on the night side. We're looking at um, glow from um, an oxygen line. And so in, on the day side, we can flip that trail bus and um, actually make the most of some of the UK instrumentation, which is located on the other side of the bus avionics. So I'll go through that in a little more detail now. So the tri-tip payloads are coming from the US Navy Research Lab. They're called um, tri-tip, partly after the stake, um, but also because it's triple tiny ionospheric photometers. Um, so this is what I was saying in terms of there's a specific configuration here that needs to be met because we're trying to get different lines of sight so that we can recreate in three dimensions for, if you add in time, um, the snapshots of the evolution of the electron density environment. Um, the technique that's actually used for tomography, it actually performs a lot better if you have sort of a sensible initial guess to start from. So you're not just you know, starting your modeling process from scratch. Um, if you can feed that sensible information, you can arrive at um, a significantly superior conclusion. Um, and the sketch up on the top right um, gives you an illustration here of how the lead and trail buses, those different lines of sight will combine to build up that picture. Focusing now on the payloads from the UK, um, we've called our suite of instrumentation IRIS, which is in situ and remote ionospheric sensing suite. Um, and I went really heavy on UK academia here for several reasons. One, I think there's an education piece to be done. At DSTL, we work on technology readiness levels, primarily less than TRL5. Um, so we're really about the novel, the unusual, you know, what can we do? What's the art of the possible? Um, and I think actually partnering with academia there um, is a really sweet spot to hit. Industry, fantastic capabilities as well. Um, but when we're after that sort of one of a kind, what could we do? Um, academia has a significant strength there. Um, and two, we've had, you know, UK academia have been experimenting in space since way before we had an established industry. So there's an awful lot of heritage um, and some real um, world-class expertise, particularly when we couple that with the theme of space weather, which the UK is extremely strong in. Um, so for Muller Space Science Laboratory at UCL, we're flying the ion and neutral mass spectrometer. And um, this has been flown on a previous mission, um, QB50 and Technomasat 2014. So we're flying one of these on each bus. Um, we're working with the University of Bath um, which is flying CHOPCAT2. So this is a triple frequency GPS 
receive capability, again, one on each bus. Um, Chopcat 1 was actually flown on board the UK Space Agency's UQ1 launch. It wasn't just a quick turn of the handle here because um, the GPS Novatar receiver that's used um, isn't produced anymore. So we had to use a new one, which is then a whole new electronic design. So there's actually quite a lot of new work that's gone into this. <laughs> and then we're also flying a radiation monitor, um, version 3.0. And this is sourced from um, Surrey Satellite Technologies with input from University of Surrey. Um, this was already a fairly compact um, radiation monitor, but we've actually further reduced the swap down to just two printed circuit boards now. Um, and this is taking advantage of a separation of components into effectively noisy and quiet. So quite a comprehensive suite of instrumentation. And we basically have drawn these together. SSTL have performed the integration. And in the middle cab model, you can see there, um, it's a 3D clamshell structure that's been used to actually house all these different components together. Um, so I don't have a laser pointer, but you've got the arrows there um, in terms of being able to see where they're top cap triple frequency GPS payload is, and the antenna, if you have a mouse, um, the antenna, all that is sit sitting here. And um, this is the iron and metal payload. And then we have the radiation monitor fixed in here. So you can literally hold iris in your hand. So I was explaining at the beginning, these cube satellites themselves are not huge. And then obviously we have one part of this for the UK suite of instrumentation. Um, the team actually worked extremely hard on this project. Um, we literally went from approval of the design concept to environmentally tested payload delivery. And when I say environmentally tested, I mean to NASA standards. Um, so the team worked very hard. We delivered at pace, on time, um, in just one year. And then we hit COVID and all of the bus integration um, and environmental testing, a lot of which was done remotely um, because the buses have actually been put together in the US um, at a place called Blue Canyon Technologies. So this shows you um, a cab model of the entire bus. So effectively, um, the tri-tip instruments I spoke about from the US Naval Research Lab sit here. And this is where the IRIS suite sits. And in the middle, we have the bus avionics. So what are we doing with this data? Well, why is it useful? So we're looking just out of the iris suite alone, and we're looking to be able to improve our understanding of atmospheric drag. Um, and this is really focused around better understanding um, the density and the chemistry of a layer that coexists with the ionosphere, but is called the thermosphere. This is really important. We saw in um, February, um, just earlier this year, the loss of about 40 um, of sort of 48 Starlink satellites that were launched. Um, the impact of space weather on the density of the thermosphere can have significant impacts um, in terms of rapidly increasing that drag environment. So we want to better understand that. There is just a dearth of information about that. There is some, but not enough. Um, we're looking to validate um, the tomography algorithm called MIDAS. Um, this is um, worked on at the University of Bath. Um, and we'll be looking to basically derive the total electron content. Again, that electron density is really important in understanding the propagation of radio frequency waves. Um, and then we'll be looking at areas of increased radiation and specifically building up a picture at the 555 kilometers altitude. Um, and that helps us map things like the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, and it also contributes to what has been a near continuous data set since the early 90s. Um, and that information we hope will be available to support um, you know, the sort of widely used radiation models that we have as well. We are looking to pull this information in to enhance our current ionospheric now casting and forecasting capabilities. Um, so the tools that we have developed at DSTL um, in partnership with both industry and academia and have been designed in a modular fashion, explicitly so they are rapidly able to ingest new data sources. Um, and we are looking here to demonstrate the benefit of having superior information in a regional context um, and then enhancing your ability to do accurate ray tracing and produce data products and decision aids for our end users. So I wanted to just take a minute towards the end. First of all, I'll just point out this is um, hopefully identifiable as Spaceport Cornwall. Um, this is Cosmic Girl here sitting on the runway. I think I'm correct in saying, yes, I'm definitely correct in saying this is the um, hangar where um, the integration of all of the satellite payloads on board this launch has taken place. Um, and I have permission from the BBC to share this with you. 
in the forum today. So there's no sort of sound, um, but what this is actually showing you is the payload fairing um, inside Spaceport Cornwall. We have here um, the satellites that have been really hard to drill up here um, integrated. And obviously the payload fairing is massive and could in theory take a whole stack of um, different satellite missions. Um, but it just gives you an insight into the facility that's um, now very much up and running and functional um, at Spaceport Cornwall in, in UK. Um, and I particularly like the ends of this um, because I think it's going to zoom in for me in a second. So I can really point out we've got here we go, Cersei 2 bus and Cersei number one, all packaged up in their dispensers, ready for launch. So thanks very much for your attention. I can't take any questions. Thank you very much, Gemma. That was super. Um, are there any questions? In the room or online? Let's put on there from. Thanks, Jenna. That was fascinating. Um, I do have a question for you, but before I ask it, um, I'm just going to say how good it is to see Topcat 2 on there. Uh, Dave and others in the audience here know UK1 is very close to my heart. Um, and, and I did work with the team on Topcat 1, so I'm really thrilled to see Topcat 2 going up soon. Um, my question is, uh, I was interested to hear you say you, you went from design concept to delivery on the payload in the 12 months. And we're always dealing with schedule and trying to get things in a streamlined way, trying to do things faster. It often doesn't take just 12 months to do these things. What would you say were the most important things that you did, that your team did to make that happen so quickly? Hey, thanks, Caroline. I say... Number one is passion. Caring about what you're doing is absolutely fundamental to having a really engaged team um, that are really willing to pour their heart and soul into making something happen. So I think that's really important. And that for me is a huge benefit of working with academia because I feel the motivation, I mean, people have spent their careers doing this stuff. They really genuinely care about it. Um, and it means we're able to work with literally world-class scientists and engineers. So I think that's really fundamental. And to echo some of Paul's Paul Bates' um, comments earlier, it's about being a team. It's about having everybody on board, understanding what the objective is and all pulling together. And um, so I think everyone just, just worked really, really hard. And um, we did a lot of face-to-face -face communication as well. And um, it was quite an intense period. It's a lot of fun as well. It was really, really good. And then, you know, it's really, We've built really good relationships. And, and when I say the team, I mean, this is an international effort. So, you know, people think Cube satellites are small, therefore it won't cost very much. You don't need as many resources. It doesn't necessarily follow like that. You still need, you don't necessarily have to have a huge team, but you need the right skill set within that. And that can mean some people dropping in and out as, as required. Um, yeah, does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Fun. That seems to be part of it. Yeah, it is. That's a huge part of it. And it's a nice sort of outreach example as well with them sort of schools and, and colleges as well. And again, this is why we're really keen and pleased that the university sector in the UK has been so heavily involved in this. Thanks, Gemma. Are there any more questions? No, I'd certainly like to echo that in terms of success criteria for missions. If you're able to do something in a year, you must have a really impressive team that enjoy working together Definitely. because there's no way things like that work otherwise. Thank you. Thank you very much.